Hello, everybody. Welcome into Talking Fitchburg on this first day of July, July 1st, 2021. I'm Jeremy Crosby. Hope you had a wonderful day. Glad you're tuning in with us for Talking Fitchburg in a busy July 1st, Talking Fitchburg. We got a lot to get to today. We'll be talking with Fitchburg Fire Department about fireworks safety and, uh, well, what's legal, what's not legal. And uh, as I mentioned in the promo, kind of quietly, what is legal? Not much. So we got to keep that... Uh, yeah, we'll be uh, breaking all that down coming up here in just a little bit of time. Plus, we're checking in with Fitchburg uh, Historical Society today. We're going to be talking about roads. Yeah, the roads of Fitchburg. We'll take a look back at that uh, with uh, Ket uh, Catherine Schneider. Andrew's telling me that's lead roads, which just doesn't sound right at all. So <laughs> it's going to be an interesting uh, breakdown uh, coming up on that uh, as well. First, let's get to a couple of headlines for you here today. Vacation Watch. You uh, planning a vacation? Fitchburg Police Department offers Vacation Watch. The department provides free Vacation Watch service to residents of the city of Fitchburg by listing, listing your home with the department for Vacation Watch. When time permits, patrol officers will periodically stop by and check your home. Officers may walk around your home to see if there has been any force entry or damage, although this is not a guarantee that your home will not be damaged or burglarize, it does give you some added peace of mind. We encourage you to make the arrangements, family members, friends, neighbors as well, check the home. Uh, when you can request a vacation watch, you just go to the website, fitchburgwi.gov, and then uh, to the police department and vacation watch, you'll see the form there. If you got any questions, you can call the police department 270-4300. All right, Pack in the Park is uh, got a date uh, returning this year, uh, as long as everything uh, stays uh, good here as far as the pandemic goes. Pack in the Park will be held uh, this year on Friday, August 6th, uh, starting at 6 p.m. at McKee Farms Park. So stop on out. They've got all of the uh, kids' games, inflatable prizes, food for purchase. It's a lot of fun. If you haven't been out to it, it ends with a movie, uh, outdoor, uh, big, huge, huge movie. So uh, stop on out for that kind of a way that the uh, rec department ends the summer each and every year. It's a lot of fun for the kiddos. All right, Operation Dry Water. This is coming in from the Dane County Sheriff's Office here. It says the Dane County Sheriff's Office Marine and Trail Enforcement joins the U.S. Coast Guard, this National Association of State Boat Law Administration, and the Wisconsin DNR and other marine law enforcement throughout the state for this weekend for the annual Operation Dry Water campaign. The coordinated effort is designed to remind boaters about the dangers of boating under the influence. That's a BUI, by the way. And increase uh, outreach education enforcement throughout 4th of July weekend. According to the U.S. Coast Guard, there were 767 recreational boating fatalities across the nation in 2020. And intoxicated boating was cited as one of the leading contributing factors of those boating incidences. The Dane County Sheriff's Office Marine and Trail Enforcement wants to remind those using our beautiful lakes and waterways to stay sober while operating a boat where U.S. Coast Guard uh, approved personal flotation device, test your boat lights before leaving the dock, and ensure you have an accessible, fully charged and serviceable fire extinguisher on your vessel. Wisconsin law does, uh, Wisconsin law requires those born after June, or January 1st, excuse me, January 1st, 1989, to pass a boater safety course to carry a boater education car. The course can be ex uh, accessed uh, online at www.boat. Uh, boat.com <laughs> backslash uh, Wisconsin if you want to uh, get uh, uh, get that uh, course in there. All right. And we want to remind you too to celebrate uh, Independence uh, Day weekend uh, safely. Wisconsin DOT uh, reminding you uh, to buckle up, plan your routes ahead of time, and uh, be careful in those work zones. Vehicles that have not driven recently should be inspected for safe travel, which includes checking tire pressure and fluid levels. Wisconsin DOT and the State Patrol also offers these uh, quick reminders. Slow down, eliminate distractions, uh, especially in work zones. You cannot use uh, cell phones in work zones, and really you shouldn't use them at all. I'm just saying. Make sure you buckle up when you head out, and uh, all Wisconsin rest areas are open. The facilities offer restroom and break from uh, traffic. Travel. For up-to-date information on work zone instances that may be affecting your travel, you can go to the 501 uh, that's downloading. Either uh, go out to the website, download, follow it on Twitter, or again, visit the website, 501wi.gov. All right, we need to take a quick break. Coming up next, we open up our digest. We're going to be talking about fireworks safety with Adam Dorn of the Fitchburg Fire Department next right here on TF. We're all 
just trying to keep things running for those who rely on us. Ready! That's why we don't have time to be sick with the flu. And especially this year, no one has time to get sick. Get a flu shot for yourself and those around you too. Welcome back into Talking Fitchburg. Joining me today from the Fitchburg Fire Department is your friend, my friend, Adam Dorn. Dorn, how are you doing today, sir? Great. How are you, Jeremy? I'm doing wonderful. You're everybody's friend. Did you know that? I did. I did. Just because you're friends with everybody. So. I, I, that's what I try to be. Try to, try to meet new people and, uh, and make lots of friends. Uh, and today we're going to talk not about friends, but about fireworks. And that's just the toughest transition to make right there. Friends to fireworks. Uh, fireworks safety, a serious topic uh, uh, indeed. And uh, first and foremost, uh, foremost, Dorn, what's the, uh, what's the rule in Fitchburg for fireworks? The most basic, simplest way to explain this is that if the fireworks leave the ground, as in it goes up into the air and explodes or whatever, if it leaves the grounds, it is illegal. Do not use them. Or you need to have the appropriate licenses, permits to do that kind of fireworks. So you're telling me that I can't, I can't do any of the tubes, any of the, the multi-shooter, you name it, it goes in the air and repeats, that's out? Right, yeah, no mortars, that kind of stuff, unless you have the permits and you have everything lined up with fire department and the city and everybody else. All those things need to be in the place before you could use something like that. All right. Well, in all seriousness, there's a good reason for that. Uh, and uh, certainly fireworks uh, cause a lot of issues, not only on the fire end of things, but uh, from scaring animals to um, burns to you name it, uh, it can be a dangerous time. And uh, from past talks, uh, you know, I, I know this conversation through and through, Dorn. I know what you're going to say, uh, but we'll start with uh, what, during the season, uh, what from the fire, fire department standpoint, uh, what, uh, what safety measures would you suggest uh, people take here as far as uh, safety in, in fireworks? The biggest, easiest thing that we can suggest is to let the professionals handle the fireworks. Um, people over the years, um, every year, get hurt, injured. Um, they lose their hands, sometimes their limbs. Uh, when it comes to uh, the use of fireworks. And we don't want to see that. We don't want to have anybody getting hurt in our city, in our state, anywhere. Um, we want you to be safe. So please let the professionals handle the fireworks. And talking on a professional standpoint, if a, a company is hired and comes out uh, in Fitchburg, uh, wherever that is, um, uh, it's been a while uh, since we've had some, but uh, when they do come out, what are some of the things that that professional company does and, and what do they do to work with you guys as well, as far as coming into the city? So kind of set us up here that uh, it, there's a lot of pre-planning that goes into this and uh, what does that look like? Great question, Jeremy. The, like you said, there is a lot of pre-planning that does go into an event like this. So um, what has to happen is that they have to, apply for a permit through a city for a pyrotechnics display, which is fireworks. Um, and then on top of that, they have to provide that they have insurance and all the other uh, legalities are met in whatever the requirements are for that type of fireworks display. That's just from the city end. Um, and then the fire department gets to look at it and we say, okay, are they meeting all the regulations that are put in place uh, by the local, the state, and the national standards that, you know, if they're going to be putting on a display, they need to make sure that um, their, the, the area where they're lighting the fireworks off is so far away from other areas, uh, what's going on, that kind of stuff, uh, where they're storing them. Um, all of that plays into a huge safety net, you could call it, that we make sure is put in place uh, before the event is ever given the green light to move ahead. Um, not only do we look at it, I know the police department will look at it for safety issues on their end. Um, building inspection may be involved depending on where they want to do things, right? So it's not just the fire department, but the whole city kind of get, comes together and says, okay, is this safe for our city? Is this safe for our, the people that are going to be um, spectating, watching this? And is it safe for the people that are actually lighting off the fireworks? All of those little things come into play 
And there's, there is a big list that everybody has to go through to make sure that everybody's ready to go. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, I think backs up your statement about leaving it to the professionals. Uh, a lot of things go into it uh, for safety. And I don't think fireworks and safety really go together. I don't think there's a firework that you can really say is uh, safe, uh, uh, no matter what it is, even down to the sparklers, uh, which is a definitely another topic uh, that's uh, really focused on during this time. Uh, what's the problem with uh, sparklers overall? Well, when you look at sparklers, sparklers burn at 1200 degrees Fahrenheit. That is warmer than what it takes to melt a glass. Melting glass takes about 900 degrees. Wood burns at about 575 degrees. When you bake a cake or bake something in the oven, it's roughly 350 degrees. And you can boil water at 212 degrees. All of those things can burn you. But now when you look at sparklers, that's 1200 degrees. When we wear our, our turnout gear, our turnout gear um, actually does not even protect us at 1200 degrees. I mean, the sparklers could burn right through our turnout gear and we could be injured if we're, we're not careful. Um, at 1200 degrees, metal starts to elongate. It starts to uh, misshape, right? Uh, it just, changes its shape and everything else. So think about you're giving a little kid a sparkler that's burning 1200 degrees and you're expecting them to hold it in their hand. Well, who knows what's gonna happen, right? We don't, we don't want the little ones or anybody to be holding on to sparklers and have, have an issue because what's the first thing that happened? What would your first reaction, Jeremy, be if you had something hot fall on your hand, one of the sparks fall on your hand as you're holding the sparkler, what would you do? Well, I would uh, probably drop the sparkler if I had it in my hand uh, right away, drop it on the ground and, you know, boy, I'd probably burn myself even worse. I don't know. I think it would lead to, uh, to other, uh, other uh, fire risks, I think, from burning, uh, burning you or somebody else around you. Yeah. Um, you know, me personally, I think I might, might probably kind of do one of these to try and, you know, get rid of it, get it out of my hand and not just drop it, just go like this. And exactly who knows where you're going to launch that sparkler. And it's not just going to go out. It's going to continue to burn until all of the stuff on the sparkler that burns causes a spark is gone. So there's no real good way to extinguish those. So if you have it in your hand and you toss it, where does that land? What else does that catch on fire? I mean, there's all these different things that play into it. Um, just one of the many reasons why sparklers are not a great idea, even though they seem so safe, right? Um, but it, it's a huge, huge, uh, it accounts for a lot of injuries that are seen throughout the month of July, around the July 4th timeframe in, uh, in hospitals and emergency rooms, so. Yeah, it's uh, very, uh, very true. Uh, to top uh, on burns there uh, for all ages, not just kids. I mean, but you tend to, play, you know, use these uh, in lieu of something else. And uh, I think that's why that there's more burns on that one, because it it's deemed maybe the safest firework. And again, that's where I go back and say there really is no safe firework, no matter which way you look at it. Um, uh, finally, Dorn, uh, we know people are going to partake in it. We know, I mean, it, it is what it is. Um, uh, and so uh, as far as uh, your final message here, as we close out today uh, for people keeping safe and preventing fires, I would have actually talked more about with the drier conditions prior to all the rain, we would have been having a think a different discussion here uh, this year because of uh, the dry conditions, but it's definitely been raining. That still doesn't rule out the fact that there could be um, fire starter about this, but either way, uh, leave us with your final thoughts as far as fireworks and uh, safety this year. Um, big thing, like we said, we started the started their segment with it. Leave the professionals to do the fireworks displays. If you want to do something at home, try using glow sticks. Glow sticks are a great safe alternative to a sparkler, and they're they're a lot of fun. The kids love them. Um, try using noisemakers instead of sparklers or you know, other types of fireworks devices. Set up an outdoor movie night, maybe the screen and projector. Uh, don't forget your bug spray because you'll probably need that now. Uh, <laughs> but 
right? You silly string. Um, you can do different crafts with the with the family and whatnot. Another one that I heard of recently was throwing a birthday party for the USA, which I thought was kind of a cool cool way to do that and have a cake. You know, don't need to have candles on the cakes necessarily, because that's another whole issue that we could talk about with the use of candles. But use your fireworks appropriately if you are going to get them, and when you are done after they have been lit off, put them in a bucket of water and let them sit there overnight. Let them sit in the water so that everything is completely soaked so you don't have an issue with uh, a possible rekindle or some sort of a fire starting later on. And do not throw them in your garbage right away. Yeah, and I, we are not by any means uh, uh, endorsing that you use fireworks or anything and leave it to the professionals but uh we also know that uh people are gonna do it so uh, you know if you're gonna partake you got to take every single precaution that necessary and uh, definitely to avoid fire i definitely uh know that from past experience definitely want not past firework uh well we'll just leave it at that <laughs> use a bucket of water you need to have that I came out wrong. All right, Doran, I appreciate your time and uh, certainly uh, more resources online uh, about firework safety and whatnot. But again, uh, Doran, one more time, uh, firework law basic is? If it goes up in the air, it is illegal and you need a permit for it. So if you don't have that permit and something's going up in the air, don't use it. There you go. All right, Doran, thank you so much for your time. As always, stay safe out there. We'll catch up with you soon. Thanks, Jeremy. Have a good one. You as well. Adam Dorn, Fitch Fire Department. Again, check the website uh, for resources. A lot of great resources out there. Uh, exactly this. And yeah, I like the throw a party, throw a birthday party for the country. I think that's a really cool idea. Well, uh, take a break. Continue next. We are on Talking Fitch Break. After you joined our family, it was like, I really do feel complete now. Brandon met a girl on a dating app. He finally found the courage to ask her out. No answer. He started to panic. Was he being- Hey, sorry I didn't respond, I was driving. She must be a keeper. Welcome back into Talking Fitchburg. Join me today from the Fitchburg Historical Society. Got Catherine Schneider here. Catherine, welcome back to the show. How are you doing today? Thank you. I'm doing very well, Jeremy. Thank you. And thank you for joining me. And today we're going to be talking about roads. And some people are going to be like, oh, no, not more road construction. No, 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 no. We're actually talking uh, uh, some of the history uh, here of uh, the roads in uh, Fitchburg, but really going back, really going back here, Catherine. So uh, set us up. What are we talking about today? Okay, well, um, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the story I'm going to be telling today about Early Road in Fitchburg is taken from uh, the book by Thomas Kenny, uh, which is uh, Irish Settlers in Fitchburg, well researched and written book. So uh, the story comes from there. Um, so this is about one of the earliest roads in Fitchburg that no longer exists. And um, just the background is the lead mining in southwestern Wisconsin, of course, attracted a lot of pioneers. Uh, the Native Americans were the first lead mining in that, did the first lead mining in that area, but then followed by Welsh and Cornish and Irish um, coming in to do the, do the mining in, by the 1820s. So towns like New Diggings and Platteville and Mineral Point, of course, get their names from um, those rich lead mines uh, around their towns. So the lead was used uh, making products like paints and pipes and bullets, so pretty important product. Um, so the question was how to get them to market, how to get that um, lead ore to market um, as efficiently as possible. So much of it was um, shipped on steamboats going down the Mississippi River and then to the East Coast and then they had processing plants in New York and Boston and Great Britain even. Well, by 1836, some of the mine owners were uh, looking for quicker and cheaper routes uh, to get their uh, product uh, to, um, to those plants, processing plants. So overland seemed to make sense. And doing that by um, canvas covered wagons 
and those would be pulled by like four to six or eight oxen. Um, and across uh, southern Wisconsin to Lake Michigan, and then they would be shipped out from Lake Michigan through the Great Lakes. And then uh, Buffalo, New York actually was one of uh, their uh, ports of entry then to be processed there into white lead uh, used for paint. So the return trip then um, they made, and then they brought back dry goods back into Wisconsin territory at that point and immigrants. Um, so it all made sense, this transportation system. So what did Fitchburg have to do with that? Well, there were several routes that were built through South Central Wisconsin um, that were used to transport the lead. And one of them crossed through Fitchburg. <laughs> um, and this route uh, probably came in between about 1839, 1841. So we're talking 190 years ago or so, a long time ago. Um, so 1839, interestingly enough, was a dry year, um, and it lowered the level of the Mississippi River. So it made it difficult to navigate uh, the boats with lead. And so the Mineral Point Teamsters were looking for um, a route to Milwaukee with the fewest inclines and then water crossings. So they, um, because they were paid by the shipment and they preferred routes with fewer obstacles, obviously. <laughs> so the topography of, of Fitchburg is um, located, it's located actually on pretty high ground and separates two watersheds. Um, it's the Yahara River to the east and then the Sugar uh, River to the west. So this minimized the problems for crossing the rivers and, and the marshlands with those heavy wagons. So maps aren't really available to show the entire route of that um, lead road, but um, later maps show parts of it, and then there's oral tradition, and then there's still some ruts um, left from the wagons in some places and a few places, so it helps kind of piece together that that route. So from Mineral Point, the wagons followed what's now um, Highway 18151 into Verona, and then they headed over Nesbitt Road, and then southeast to avoid the four lakes, um, Mendota, Monona, Wabisa, and, and Kiganza in central Dane County. And then the land wagons entered Fitchburg, likely um, around the intersection of Lacey and Fitchrona Roads, after going around the north end of there's Goose Lake in the township of Verona, they have to go north, uh, north of that to avoid Goose Lake. Uh, so then after they crossed at uh, Grand, uh, sorry, crossed at um, Lacey and Fitchrona Roads, where they are now, of course they didn't exist then. Um, then they crossed where Grandview Road is now to Seminole Highway, and then continued southwest. Um, to meet where Fish Hatchery Road and Adams Road are now, where that intersection is. Then there was a resting stop and place to water horses and oxen known as Swan Pond. And that was located at the um, south of the intersection of Fish Hatchery Road and County M. So this was um, the exit point for, um, from Fitchburg for the lead trail. And then it continued its journey toward Oregon and eventually to Watertown and then to Milwaukee. Well, the physical evidence of that trail is now virtually gone. And the reason for that is because it ran diagonally through Fitchburg. The farming uh, farmers, of course, always want their fields to be square and rectangular. So the roads then that were put into Fitchburg were ran north, south, and east and west. So that trail was no longer no longer um, uh, possible through there with the roads running in those directions over those six square miles of what was then the township of Fitchburg. Um, so the other change that took place that meant the end of the lead trails was the coming of the railroads in about the 1850s. So that provided, of course, faster and cheaper transportation um, of goods um, than wagons drawn by oxen. So thus the lead trail has faded into history. But I think it makes a fascinating story that we had this trail that used to run uh, through the township of Fitchburg and brought the iron 
um, the iron ore from southwestern Wisconsin, uh, the western part of the state, early on, um, right through right through the right through Fitchburg, and then on to Milwaukee through the Great Lakes over to the East Coast. So. Uh, Fitchburg had an important uh, part to play in that that early uh, early mining history of the state of Wisconsin. Yeah, it's so. it's something uh, great, great uh, information. Thanks for sharing. It's something to believe, you know, to think of that, uh, you know, down at Petrona and Lacey and 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 Seminole. You would have to think, and I would think going back to, uh, because you grew up here. Um, just thinking of like some field roads or something, you know, uh, granted that obviously the farmers did, uh, you know, had to farm and everything, but it had been interesting, uh, you know, thinking back to when you were growing up, thinking of any of the farm, farm roads that were going between the fields or anything like that, if, uh, if potentially, you know, that uh, you could have walked on that or you could have been, uh, you know, been near that, but uh Still a major thorough through as far as Fatrona and Lacey goes, and and really the eighteen one or fifty one uh, going back to Mineral Point and stuff. Uh, I just think of all those hills <laughs> once you get to Mineral Point and stuff. But uh, wow, what a story! Yeah, I think I think it's pretty fascinating, and then to know that that intersection of also um, Fish Hatchery Road and M now was the. Uh, was sort of a way station with the Swan Pond down there. And now those roads are still major intersection. And uh, if you notice, the water is still there. So if you're driving through there at some point on the road, uh, check the south end there and you'll see the, the pond where, where they used to we used to stop. There used to be a hotel there uh, as travelers came through there. Um, it was, it was is known that intersection is all so another um, uh, further you know just uh, interesting uh, history of that of that very intersection how prominent it was and still is in uh, in our transportation system in Fitchburg and beyond yeah well Catherine thank you so much for sharing and uh, uh, great information if people want to learn more about uh, the things uh, that you guys have going on at the uh, historical society where can they find you Oh, yes. And our website, of course, uh, fitchburghistory.org. And I was going to say the, uh, the book uh, that I got this information from is also in the Fitchburg Library. So uh, could, be, um, could be accessed uh, at the library. So um, lots of other great stories in there, too. We have a wonderful history, rich heritage to celebrate in Fitchburg. We certainly do. Catherine, thank you so much for uh, sharing today. And uh, uh, just like this and other interviews, we got them all posted up uh, online and uh, same with the Historical Society. You can check out their YouTube page and uh, uh, catch these uh, great interviews. Catherine, stay safe out there. We'll look forward to checking back in with you next month. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Take care. And you as well. I'll take a quick break. More to come. You are watching Talking Fitchburg. If you love them enough to suck the snot out of their nose at 4 a.m., then surely you'll check NHTSA.gov slash the right seat to make sure they're in the right car seat. Welcome back into Talking Fitchburg. Wrapping up the show for the day, I want to thank Catherine Schneider from the Fitchburg Historical Society for helping us out, talking about the roads, and Adam Dorn, Fitchburg Fire Department, telling us about fireworks safety. Again, if it goes up, goes boom, it's a no-no. Just plain as simple as that. All right, as we wrap up, remember you can uh, take us if you're heading out. Just saying, you you can take your Apple TV anywhere or your Roku anywhere, right? Or maybe just your cell phone. I don't know. Have a safe uh, and fun day, everybody. <laughs>